All right, let's start off by doing the routine. You know what I'm talking about. I'm going to go ahead and do that. Copy, paste, make class public. And all animated objects are game objects, all right? And the reason we are making it a game object and not a character is because some game objects in our game will want to animate, all right? But maybe those objects aren't characters. So if it's like a static power-up that just spins around and does some fancy rotation, that doesn't need to be a character that moves around like a bodied person, all right? So later we'll make the character derived from animated object um, so it gets all this functionality. And then this way, if we have a simple game item in the future that needs to animate, it can still derive from this as well. So first we need to define some variables that all animated objects will need. The obvious first one should be a protected int called current animation frame. And this is the current animation that we are on Right, so remember back in the editor, we let's say we are currently in the run left animation. There are like 12 different frames that it goes through. So we need to keep track of which frame we're currently on. Are we on the second frame, the third frame? Right, and then eventually after we cycle through all of those frames, we will repeat the animation and start it back at zero again so it endlessly loops. Next we need a protected float called animation timer. And this is the timer that we use to move the frames along. So remember earlier, we defined a speed for each animation. I believe it was four for the run and 16 for the idle. Well, this timer will keep track of that. And after four frames of displaying the current running frame, it will increase the current animation frame and move us along, just like a flip book. So each frame in the animation would get four frames of display time before moving on to the next frame in the grid. Next we need some protected ints called current animation X and current animation Y. Remember in the last video we touched on the source rectangle and the source rectangle that gets thrown into sprite batch is how we define which chunk of the image we want to draw. So we're about to do that again. We need to calculate which chunk of the image has the frame we're currently looking at. So we will need to have an X and Y position that is moved to be the top left corner of whatever frame we're currently trying to draw. Next we need a protected animation set called animation set. I'm going to go ahead and create a new instance of that. And this will contain every single animation that this object can perform. So the running and the idle. Next, we need a protected animation called current animation. And we will set this to look at whatever animation we are currently running inside of the animation set. So this is more or less just a helper variable. That way we don't have to uh, find or look through the animation set every single time we want to access the current animation we're running, we can just have an easy to use variable here. That's a little easier to code with. Next down here, we'll make a protected bool called flip right frames. We will default that to true. And remember earlier I said that whenever we made that run right animation, we would just take the frames in the run left animation and then flip it. If for whatever reason we don't want to do that, if we have art that has a right animation defined, we could set this to false at any time so it doesn't do that. Uh, additionally, if we are working with art that has the right frame being drawn but not the left frame, we'll make another bull here called flip left frames. And that will flip the opposite direction. So if you don't have art for the left direction but you have art for the right direction, it will look for any animation that has the word left and automatically flip the right frames to look like it's the left direction art, right? Oh, and one more thing. We need a protected sprite effects called sprite effect. 
it's set to sprite effects dot none but notice in this sprite effects thing here we have the option to flip horizontally or flip vertically we will want to use the flip horizontally option whenever we are flipping frames okay but right now we'll set that to none and we will set that appropriately in a later function finally we need a protected enumeration called animations and if you haven't seen an enumeration before basically it's like having uh, integers that are defined with text so I'm going to put a few things in this enumeration I'm going to put in the name of the animations we defined earlier in the editor so run left run right idle left idle right and technically these are just ints so if you look at it it says run left equals zero run right equals one idle left equals two idle right equals three we're just doing this because it's easier to code with this text instead of trying to figure out okay the current animation is currently two what animation is that again is, is that the idle right the idle left you know that way we don't have to play that game we can just write it just as it is now one thing to note about this enumeration is that whatever animations you put in here these have to be spelled exactly like you spelled them in the editor all right so if for me I spelled it run left with a capital R and a capital L so this will match up perfectly and work if you did not name your animations like that this won't run so I would recommend you go back into the editor and make it like mine just for the sake of simplicity and following along and all that all right um, we are about to later in a second we will add code that automatically puts a space between this whenever we're trying to look up the name of the animation in the animation set because remember in the animation set the names will have that space in there so basically whenever we say hey change the animation to be the enumeration run left we will run a helper function that puts a space in there and then looks for this exact string inside of the animation set okay now this you could do this a little differently this is just my personal preference you could if you'd like just never add spaces <laughs> okay um, in how you define the animations in the editor and then you don't have to do all that and you could always just spell with lowercase everywhere like whatever naming convention you want to adopt that's fine with me I, I don't really care it's personal preference there's some people that might think my way of doing this is stupid but I like to spell it kind of like normal English capitals and spaces but with that being said, I'm going to go to the Michael Hicks toolbox and inside the code folder and the functions folder, there is a text file here called add spaces to sentence. And these are the helper functions I was just describing. We can hit control A, control C to copy these and then return to Visual Studio and paste them. Um, it's going to throw an error here. It's looking for the string builder class but that's easily uh, fixable. If you were to Google string builder namespace, you would see that we need to include system.txt at the very top here. So as soon as we do that, the errors go away. But basically, these are just helper functions that will add spaces. So see here, I have this example of if this was passed in, if this was passed in with spaces, would be returned. So it's looking for capital letters and right before each capital letter that's not the initial one so it'll ignore the very first capital letter here but as soon as it finds one that has a lowercase before it it will immediately put a space there and then there and then there so hopefully you get that don't worry about how it's working it's just uh, a helper function you can paste in so now I'd like to start writing the functions that we need to animate our character so the first one that I'd like to write is pretty simple. We need a way to determine if the animation has completed. So remember in the run animation it goes from frame 0 to 12 and let's say we're on frame 12 and the timer has turned to 0. We want to have a bull here that says hey the animation is complete we've ran through all of our frames and when that bull is true or when that function returns true 
we will loop the frame back to frame zero and repeat the animation again. So let's make a public bool called animation complete and this function will return true or false depending on if we're at the end of the animation. So we can say return and then we have that current animation frame that we defined earlier, remember? So that should be used somewhere in here. But how do you think we would determine if it's at the end? Well, we could say if current animation frame is greater than or equal to the last frame in our list, so that would be current animation dot animation order dot count minus one. Right, because in programming we, we always start at zero. This uh, minus one is compensating for that. So if our current animation frame is greater or equal to the number of frames we have in our list, we know we have reached the end. All right. Next we need a way to calculate the current animation x and the current animation y. Now this will require a little bit of math. I'm not going to explain it too thoroughly because to be honest when I was first learning how to do this I just looked up equation for determining position on sprite sheet and there's people online that talked about it and they had some examples and stuff. So I, I don't think, you know, this is one of those things where you have to basically uh, type it one time and never look at it again. But we'll, I'll briefly explain what it's doing, but uh, if you're not a math person, don't freak out, <laughs> okay? I, I was never a big math person either, so. Actually, side note, I never really fully appreciated math until I started to program like this. That's when everything started to really click for me, so. But anyway, let's make a protected void called calculate frame position. And we will call this whenever we have entered into a new frame in the animation and we need to calculate where the X and Y position is so we're trying to find the top left point of each frame. So first things first let's get the coordinate for the current animation we are on. So let's say int coordinate equals current animation dot animation order current animation frame. So the coordinate would be the frame number of the frame we're currently looking at on the sheet. So remember when we were creating the animations earlier, frame 13 was the very last frame in the run left animation. The coordinate would be 13 if we were currently looking at the last frame. So now that we know what frame number we're looking at, we can calculate the current animation x and current animation y. Current animation x will equal coordinate modulus animation set dot grid x and a modulus if you're not sure what that is that's the remainder of a division all right so we're basically dividing the coordinate by how many grids we have in the x position and then whatever the remainder of that is we will multiply by animation set dot width Remember the width is how wide each frame is. So this is the equation right here that will give us the x position of this frame. Next we will set the current animation y and current animation y equals the coordinate divided by animation set dot grid x. I know intuitively you think it should be grid y but it's not, <laughs> okay? We're using grid x here, but instead of the modulus, we are using the division sign. And then multiply by animation set dot height. All right, and that will calculate the current x and y. If you're one of these people that wants to understand the in-depth math for why this works, once we get everything up and running, I would recommend coming back and tearing this apart. <laughs> Basically, you know, remove the multiplication, see what the result on the screen looks like then, remove the height multiplication, see what the result is then, try dividing instead of doing the modulus. Basically that's how I understood was by really digging into it like that and seeing visually on the screen how we are getting the result. Okay, 
I'm not going to do that right now, but feel free to do that later. You'll never have to touch this function again. We'll just call it whenever we go to a new frame. Next, let's write a new function above here called protected virtual void update animations. We'll call this on every update frame. Let's start this off by saying if current animation dot animation order dot count is less than one, we will immediately return from the function. So we can't update the animations if we don't have anything in this list. Then below here, if we pass that check, we will decrease our animation timer. So we can say minus minus or minus equal one. So each frame we take one off the timer. And then if our animation timer is less than or equal to zero, it's time to move the frame forward. So we'll s first say animation timer equals current animation dot speed. So we reset the timer to uh, be at the full speed for the next frame. So re remember in the editor, the speed for the run animation is four. So right here we would set the timer back to four and then begin counting that down again. And then when it hits zero, we would increase the frame again. If animation complete equals true. So if we have reached the last frame in our animation, we will set the current animation frame to zero. Remember, because that means it's time to loop back to the very beginning. Else, if the animation is not complete, we will just say current animation frame plus plus, and that will move us to the next frame in the list. Finally, since we have move to a new frame, we need to calculate the new frame position. So we can just call calculate frame position and that will be done. Now above the update animations function, we will override the game object update. And then after we call the base.update, we can say if the current animation is not equal to null, so if we currently have an animation playing, update animations. Now we need to implement the functionality for changing an animation. Because remember, let's say we're playing as the player, we will start off being idle, just standing, but as soon as we start moving, we will want to change the animation to be running instead of just standing now, right? So we need to implement a couple of functions to do that. Let's go underneath the uh, update animations function and let's make a private animation and this function will be called get animation and for the parameter we will pass in our animations enumeration so we can pass in idle left idle right or whatever else we've defined in this enumeration okay we can pass that into this function and it will return that animation from the list. So first thing we should do is say string name equals get animation name and then passing in the animation enumeration we passed in. So basically this is taking that enumeration that we defined earlier and converting it into a string. And that will run it through all of this uh, all these helper functions we did down here. Add spaces to sentence that function will be called um, so we will convert the enumeration text into a readable string. And then using that string, we will iterate through our list of animations and see if we find one that matches that name. So let's say for int i equals zero. For as long as i is less than animation set dot animation. Ah, we forgot to actually, hmm. There should be an animation list inside of our set that has a list of animations. Maybe we forgot to code that. I thought we did. Let's go back here to animation.cs. Ah, yeah, sure enough, we did forget that. Okay, so in the animation set class, we should have a list of all the animations that this object can perform. Remember in the editor, we had that list where we had idle right, idle left, run left, run right. We need a list here to represent that. So this is super quick, okay? 
we'll just say public list of animations like that animation list equals new list animation and make sure it's animation with no s here right we want the animation class all right and that should be good for that let's go back to animate object and now we'll iterate through animation set animation list dot count so I plus plus we are now iterating through every single animation that has been defined for this object if the animation set dot animation list at sub i if the current animation we're looking at has a name that's equal to the name we have converted from this enumeration if the names match up we will return the animation that we're looking at so we'll return animation dot set animation list sub i otherwise if we run all of this code and we are not able to find a animation that has the name that we have looked up here then we should return null no animation was found now above get animation we can write the change animation function this will swap our animation from whatever we are currently on to the animation we desire so let's create a protected virtual void called change animation it's possible we want to override this later and add additional functionality. Let's pass in an animations enumeration. Uh, let's call it new animation. This is the new animation we want to change to. And let's say current animation equals get animation new animation. So we will call that function we just wrote here. It will take the enumeration that was passed in and then try and locate it in the list of animations and it will return an instance of the animation class if it was found. If nothing was found, if current animation equals null, we want to immediately return from this function. That is possible that it can happen. Otherwise, we have a new animation, so let's start on the first frame. Current animation frame equals zero. And let's set our animation timer to be the speed that we have set for this animation. Next, we can call calculate frame position because we have set the frame to zero. So we need to make sure those variables are up to date, the current animation X and Y. And then finally, we need to check and see if this is an animation we would want to flip. So remember earlier I talked about if we don't have the right direction for the run, we can just flip the left run and he will look like he's running to the right. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's do that here. If flip right frames equals true, so if, if we want to flip anything that has the word right in it, and the current animation name contains the word right or if flip left frames equals true and the name of the current animation contains the word left if either one of these things are true oops I put the parenthesis there in the wrong place if either one of these things are true we will set our sprite effect to be sprite effects dot flip horizontally and that will flip the frames in the horizontal direction else if neither of those conditions are true we will just say sprite effect equals sprite effects dot none all right finally the very last thing we need to do is override the draw function for the animated object let's go down here towards the end and right after the animation complete function I will say public override void draw let's start off by saying if active equals false return because we don't want to draw anything next we will say if current animation X 
equals negative 1 or current animation y equals negative 1. If either one of those things are true, we will just call base.draw. And basically, that means that we don't have a valid coordinate for x or y to draw at. So we're just going to pretend like this is not an animated object. We will call the base.draw, which will call game objects draw function, and it will just draw us as if we're a normal sprite that doesn't animate. Else, if we do have a valid current animation x and a valid current animation y, we will call spritebatch.draw, passing in some unique things to draw the animation. So first off, we will sit, pass in image for the texture 2D. We'll pass in position for the vector 2. For the source rectangle, which remember this is the chunk that we want to draw off of this image, we want to draw the chunk that represents the current frame we're looking at. So we'll say new rectangle, current animation x is the x position, Current animation Y is the Y position. And the animation set width, remember this is how wide and how tall each frame is. That's how wide and how tall we want to draw this image, right? We want to draw the 128 by 128 chunk. So animation set dot height. For the color, we'll pass in draw color. For the rotation, we'll pass in rotation. For the origin, we'll pass in vector 2.0. Oops, 0, not 1. For the scale, we'll pass in our scale variable. For the sprite effects, which this is how we want to draw the sprites. Do we want to flip them horizontally? We will pass in the sprite effect variable we have defined earlier. And then finally, for the layer depth, we'll pass in layer depth. <laughs> so we're basically maxing out the sprite batch dot draw. We're using almost every parameter it offers. Okay. Now, really fast before we test this out, we need to make sure these variables, current animation x and current animation y, are starting off at negative one, and then later when we load an animation, they'll be properly set. So up here at the very top, where we did current animation x, I'm going to set that to negative one. And then same for current animation y, I'll set that to negative 1. All right, so now we can plug in this class. It's ready to be used. I'm going to go to the character.cs class. And since all characters are bodied humans that move around with physics and all that, I'm going to say that all characters should be an animated object. OK? So now, naturally, anyone who derives from character they automatically have the ability to be animated. So back in our player.cs class, our player is a fire character, and fire character is a character, and since character is an animated object, our player has the ability to animate. So down here in the load function, let's make this happen. Instead of loading the sprite, we want to load the sprite sheet, because the sprite sheet has every single frame on it, Next, we are going to load our animation stuff. Let's call load animation. Uh, oh, we, we forgot that function. So we need a, a way to actually call the animation loader. I'm sorry. I got excited. I was ready to do this. We, we are almost ready. But uh, let's go back to the animateobject.cs. And then here at the very top underneath animations, let's make a protected void called load animation. And we'll pass in path and the content manager. Here we are just going to call the load function that we wrote in animation loader. And we will return a instance of the animation data class. So let's say animation data equals animation loader dot load and then we'll pass in the path which is the file we want to load next we'll set our animation set to the set that was loaded in into the animation data 
Remember the animation data is all of the stuff that's stored in that XML file we saved out from the editor. Now that we've set our animation set to the stuff that was in the file, we can set up our initial values. So I'm going to set our center.x to the animation set.width divided by 2, and that will give us the center of each frame. Same for center.y. That will give us the proper center variable. And then let's go ahead and default the current animation variable to the first animation we find in the list. All right. So if our animation list has any type of animation in it, if there's any animation in this list, we will go ahead and set our current animation. So the animation list at index 0, that will be the very first thing in our list. And we'll set current animation frame to 0. We'll set our animation timer to, uh, let's set it to 0F, that way it immediately calls all that stuff down there. And then we'll say calculate frame position. Okay. Okay, now we can return back to the player.cs and we can call this function to load in the animation data from the XML file. So we'll say load animation. The name of the file is shyboy.anm, just like that. And remember in our animation loader class, it will look for this inside of our content animations folder. Second, let's pass in the content manager. Um, it, the default code we just wrote should do this, but just for the sake of being sure, I'm going to immediately change our animation to idle left. Then we can call base.load and load everything else in our parent classes. Finally, I would say we need to set our bounding box with the dimensions from our animation, right? In the past we were just saying bounding box width equals image dot width. If we did that now, the image width would be like 1280 or something really huge because remember now we're using that huge sprite sheet. So we want to set our bounding box width to be the width of each frame in the animation. Okay, so I'm going to do this. Uh, I'm gonna say bounding box offset x equals 0, bounding box offset y equals 0. You can, def you can play with these numbers later and make the bounding box move around if you'd like. And then bounding box width equals animation set dot width and bounding box height equals animation set dot height. Now we should be able to press F5 and see something. <laughs> Fingers crossed. I don't want to make too many promises, but we should see something. All right, I, I think it's working. Check that out. So the shy boy, you can see he is breathing up and down. Let's try moving to the right and left. Ah, uh, that's not working yet, is it? Hmm, well, that's because we have not implemented logic to change the animation when we want it to change. Um, remember when we initially loaded the animation file, we immediately changed the animation to idle left. So it is working, but now we need to implement the logic in player to change the animation to run. So that won't be too bad. Let's exit out. Down at the very bottom of player.cs, underneath the check input function here, let's override the update animations function we created in the animated object class. So let's say protected override void update animations. First thing we should say is if current animation equals null, we want to return immediately because there's nothing to do if we don't have an animation loaded. Then we can call animations to run all of that timer code that we wrote in animated object. And then after that we can implement our change animation logic. 
So let's say if velocity is not equal to vector 2.0 or we are currently jumping, if either one of those things are true, that means we're currently moving, right? Velocity, that means we're moving. So if it's not zero, that means we're moving in some type of direction. Or if we're jumping, that means we're jumping in the air. So that's movement as well. So here we'll say if direction.x is less than zero and animation is not animations.run left, we will change the animation to animations dot run left. So basically we're saying, hey, if the current direction we're looking at is less than zero on the x-axis, that means we're looking to the left. And if our current animation is not currently the run left animation, we need to immediately change our animation to be the run left. We can copy this and then below say else paste Else, if direction.x is greater than zero and animation is not currently the run right animation, we will change the animation to be run right. Then outside of this if, we can say, else if velocity equals vector 2.0, so if we're currently standing still, and jumping is equal to false, so if we're not jumping either, if both of those things are true, we can copy and paste this chunk of code here. And then we'll say if the direction dot x is less than zero and we are currently not in the idle left animation, we should change to the idle left animation. Else, if we are currently looking to the right and our current animation is not the idle right animation, we will change our animation to be idle right. All right, let's press F5 and see if this fixes it. All right, I'm going to move to the right, move to the left, and Shy Boy is alive. Check that out. I'll jump. Everything's working. I'm going to let off. And look, he goes back to the idle animation as soon as we stop moving. And as soon as the velocity hits vector 2.0, that second if statement we wrote will be called. That's cool stuff, huh? It's looking pretty nice. It's starting to uh, come alive here. The game's starting to come alive. Good job, everyone. I hope this was useful. Maybe you can create some more animations. Maybe a good exercise would be if you detect input on the keyboard that's, uh, let's say, the P key. Whenever the P key is pressed, maybe you can go and define that painting animation Remember when we were looking at the sprite sheet, there's that one animation where he's painting on the art canvas. Maybe if the P key is held down, you switch to that animation. Feel free to experiment and try some different things here with this new animation technology. And the good thing for us is in the future, whenever we want to animate something, it's super easy. We've already coded all the heavy lifting of animating stuff, so we're in pretty good shape. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.